one year ago, and I'm standing with a man who uh, had a big part of, of Starcade uh, 83, uh, Ricky Steamboat. Though it later became known as a December pay-per-view, Starcade always had its origins as a Thanksgiving Day tradition in the month of November. Beginning as a closed circuit show similar to the first WrestleMania, the first show took place in 1983 when Ric Flair beat Harley Race in a steel cage to become the new NWA World's Heavyweight Champion. Fast forward a year, Flair is still on top and now holding back the challenge of Dusty Rhodes. On this, the 39th anniversary of the show's happening because hey, why wait until 40? We're going to look back at Jim Crockett Promotions Starcade 84, the Million Dollar Challenge from the Greensboro Coliseum in Greensboro, North Carolina on Thursday, November 22nd, 1984. This show was nominated by Lawrence Ward over at patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. It is the second ever Starcade, of course, following the success of the initial one the previous year. A lot of hype going into this one as they're back in their home turf for Jim Crockett Promotions. Of course, the main event, the whole show is really anchored by this matchup for the uh, NWA World Championship and the Million Dollar Purse, Flair versus Rhodes. The undercard, historically, kind of a mixed bag, but if you look closely enough, there are some hidden gems there. So let's peel it back and let's see what happened 39 years ago today, Starcade 84. The show begins with a highlight from last year's main event, Flair beating Race in the cage for the championship. We'll see that a few more times in the course of this show. We open up with Bob Cottle and Gordon Soley. They're calling the action up in the press box as they intro the show. You can see the ring in the background there. We get a little light show around the ring. Wow, look at them lasers. Holy shit, Dan, they wrote Starcade with them lasers. Also, I love the disjointed opening by the ring announcer. Starcade 84, the premier event of the century. Looks at no. Notes. The show is pretty bare bones production wise, but at least it's shot well, so I can't complain about that. Your opening matchup for the NWA World's Junior Heavyweight Championship as Mike Davis defends against Denny Brown, aka just a couple of guys. The challenger Brown with the advantage early on. Nice head scissors, by the way, but a nice counter by Davis when he trips up the challenger and Denny falls to the outside. Oh, look at that sportsmanship by the champion. You love to see it. He gives him plenty of time to recover. He slams him and so Lee still calls him an opportunist. Like, damn, man, how much time do you want to give him? My goodness, the agility of Brown coming off the second rope there. We get a collision in the middle and both men are down. We get the back suplex, the cover, Brown gets his shoulder up. We get the three count and the match is awarded to Brown in a bit of a confusing moment because boy, the commentary is flummoxed by this. And your winner and still champion, Mike Davis. Denny Brown has got the belt there, well, Gordon. Some confusion there, some confusion there. I give it two and a half stars out of five. I thought it was a solid opening matchup. I thought even though I don't know who these guys are, I think that, you know, their stuff they did in the ring was pretty cool. The finish was a bit confusing. Doing that back suplex, the double pin, but someone gets the shoulders up, it's always kind of awkward to play out, but I feel that everything just grinds to a halt when the commentary doesn't help matters in their confusion. Like they make it almost worse as time goes on. But yeah, these guys had some good uh, offense a lot of things you don't often see in American wrestling during this time, and so I give them credit for that. A young Tony Schiavone is backstage with world champion Ric Flair pacing around. Tony says we'll be going backstage all night. It's a gigantic night of wrestling, and we'll be here in the uh, dressing room all night. Your next matchup here as the Japanese terror, Mr. Ito takes on Brian Adidas. That's all day I dream in stereo. Brian Adidas with an I in this case, even though that was kind of a mistake is what I heard. Otherwise it's been Brian Adidas with an A like the clothing brand or Brian Adidas. Uh, this is a guy who's best known for his stuff in world-class championship wrestling in Texas. He also had a run in the Portland territory at one point. He's billed here as a fast rising star. Ito looking slightly bigger but still pretty agile himself. Ito with some hair pulling but Adidas gets control of the arm. They trade some strikes. Brian throwing Ito into the ropes and gets him up for an airplane spin and holy shit it wins him the match. 
I give it one and a half stars out of five. It was a good match, technically speaking. Uh, my, my one criticism of it is I kind of wish it went a little bit longer. I thought that these guys had a good rhythm going, and if it went like two or three more minutes, I think I would have had a, a higher rating for it. Adidas is pretty over here, but does not last long in Jim Crocker promotions and goes back to world class soon after. In a match for the Florida Heavyweight Championship, Jesse Barr defends against Mike Graham, who's looking very fresh and healthy. He's the former champion, looking to regain against Oregon's own Jesse Barr, who is pretty big in Florida around this time. He is the older brother of Art and the future Jimmy Jack Funk in the WWF. Holds and counter holds to start things off. Barr fighting a little dirty here. He's grabbing some hair. Graham fights out of the arm hold for a moment, but Barr works his way back to it. Graham fights back, starts to apply torque to that leg. Jesse starts to work the test of strength real hard, and Mike's on the receiving end for a very long time. Mike finally fights out of it and up applies the arm hold again. Mike drops Barr with a punch, looks to go over the figure four, and the champ escapes the ring. Back to the headlock for Jesse, a long time in that hold, until Graham finally hits the shin breaker. The figure four is back in, Barr once again grabbing the ropes. Graham shoved into the referee, who misses the roll-up. There's some more good back and forth, Barr with a sneaky little pin at the very end to win the match and retain. I give it three stars out of five. It's my favorite match on the night thus far. I really liked the chemistry of these two had. I think they had a really good pace. I was very impressed seeing the back and forth these guys had, especially near the end of the match. We get a recap of recent television where Tully Blanchard and the Long Riders beat the hell out of Ricky Steamboat. They drive one of Tully's cowboy boots right into Steamboat's back from the second rope, and that's going to be a big target, a big talking point especially, going into their match later tonight. But enough of that. Here's this Riker-looking guy dancing to Kenny Loggins. I'm just kidding. It's the Avalanche Buzz Tyler, not to be confused with the Avalanche John Tenta. He's teaming up with the Assassin Number One to take on the team of the Zambui Express, who are accompanied by Number One Paul Jones. Zambui Express is Elijah Akeem and Kareem Muhammad, aka Bad Leroy Brown and Ray Candy, respectively. The Assassin has recently rebuked the managerial services of Paul Jones, and so now Jones is out for revenge and sickened his monsters against him. Meanwhile, you have Buzz Tyler, one of the many oddly shaped dancing white guys in the NWA. He's got the full support of the fans as he rocks one half of the Express early on here. Kareem on top and starts throwing hands at Tyler. Buzz starts fighting back and I cannot stop laughing at how Kareem is selling. The two legal men are brawling outside and they're both eliminated. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this is an elimination tag team match. So we're down to the Assassin and Elijah Akeem. Assassin and Muhammad just collide. Muhammad falls down. Assassin covers him and wins. Oh! I give it one and a half stars out of five. Things got a little confusing at the end. I think the elimination aspect of the match was a little bit lost in the sauce with this one. And uh, again, the announcers do not help things. I think they're very, um, you know, I yeah, I don't have a problem with Soli and Bob Cottle as announcers. I think for the time they're doing great. You know, it's like it's obviously of a very distinct era, but that's not even the problem. The problem is there's there's a lot of moments in this show where they're just like lost and confused as what's going on and they don't seem to be clued in and that's unfortunate because they are the ones like they're the voice they're the ones who are communicating all this to the audience and when they're super confused it can like really just kind of derail a lot of other people as well tony shivani in the dressing room alongside the american dream dusty Rhodes, slumped against the wall and deep in thought he says the time for talking is over and proceeds to keep talking about how he wants to walk away with the million dollars and the world champion Championship. I think we can all agree that licensed music for entrances in wrestling is always superior, but a very select few can pull it off really well. And if you're Mandy Fernandez in 84 and you're coming out to beat it by Michael Jackson and you get this kind of reaction, man, you are over. So now it's time for the Brass Knuckles Championship as Black Bart, accompanied by J.J. Dillon, defend against the raging bull Manny Fernandez. Fernandez is one half of the tag team champions with Dusty Rhodes at this point, and not only is he his tag team partner, he is his little mini-me as well because he has completely adopted all of Dusty's promo mannerisms and his stylings. Seriously, go watch a Manny Fernandez promo from like 82 and then jump ahead to 85. It is like night and day. So I know the dream, baby. Like I said it before, I'm not partial to no man. There's no time limit and anything goes in the brass knuckles division. Fernandez off to a good start with lots of quick chops and attacks. Bart fights back and bloodies the bull. Manny with a second wind bludgeons Bart 
until he flies out of the ring. Bart is now bleeding as well. Manny's on a roll until he's hit low. Bart's working over the challenger. Dylan throwing in Bart's bull rope, and that is his immediate undoing. Fernandez with the roll-up mid-catch and the win. Fernandez is your new Brass Knuckles champion. I'm going to give it two stars out of five. The match was fine for what it was as just kind of a quick and dirty, bloody brawl. I was just kind of surprised at how abrupt the ending of the match went and how it was immediately, as soon as there was an interference attempt, it immediately backfires. That really caught me uh, coming off guard, but it was very entertaining in that way. And of course, this match is the great prelude to an intermission. So on the show, we get some backstage interviews. Shivani goes to interview Steamboat until you hear a loud crashing noise off camera. We go back to Soli and Cottle. They go back to Tony and Ricky, and they talk. We then hear from Tully Blanchard as well. On we go now to one of the true highlights of the night, and I mean that in a very sincere way. It is a tuxedo street fight with loser leaves town, I guess just Greensboro, implications. You've got the boogie woogie man, Jimmy Valiant, going against the manager, Paul Jones, who's wearing a cape to the ring for some reason. Uh, quick little side note, watching this show during the day, uh, my kid walked in and she had never seen Jimmy Valiant before. He's a very interesting looking guy, but her immediate thought was like, Daddy, is that Dumbledore? <laughs> And now I can't unsee it. Valiant is accompanied by Jones's former charge in the assassin. Within seconds, Jimmy has tied Paul Jones to the top rope by his damn neck and really just lays into him. The boogie woogie man is doing it all, says Soli, as Valiant strips Jones down to his skivvies. But the match is not over yet. Jones has somehow freed himself and attacks Valiant, but Jimmy convulses himself into a state of domination, puts Jones in the sleeper, and we can see Jones blatantly gigging himself on camera. But what did he do? Like, it's not like he had his head, like, driven into anything. It's like Valiant was squeezing so hard, like the juice is exploding out of his head. Suddenly, Valiant decks the Zambui member at ringside and the referee for some reason. It's total bedlam now. Dylan decks Valiant with a foreign object, which is like a candy jar, a pepper grinder. I can't tell what it is. That allows a beaten and bloody Paul Jones to cover and win the match. Brilliant! And look, I love this match, but objectively, I gotta give it like one star to five. It is just very silly madness. Not much of a match per se, but a very wild segment. I like when that kind of story of the guy who gets his ass beat and then there's this big like swerve at the end. Oh my God, he like didn't look like a winner, but he still beat the guy officially. Like that was really well done. As for uh, Jimmy Valiant, he would not be gone for long. He came back under a mask as Charlie Brown from out of town, which I have covered a little bit in another classic review here. And of course we can't forget Jimmy Valiant's biggest contribution to this channel when he starred in Ultimate Deathmatch 2. Tony Schiavone backstage with Ric Flair with his parting words before the main. He says whether people like him or dislike him, they all know he's the best. Calls himself the number one stud in professional wrestling. On we go to a match for the Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Championship as Cowboy Ron Bass takes on Dirty Dick Slater. Slater recently has made kind of an enemy of Tully Blanchard and the rest of J.J. Dillon's camp, so that brings us this match here. Slater is very unpredictable. Tries chasing Dillon around the ring a couple of times at the start. Finally gets to grappling his opponent. They work the headlock for a long time. The ref needlessly gets involved in Slater's stomping and that allows Bass to take over. Slater's doing the seesaw spot. Soli says he looks like a jack-in-the-box. Gordon, that is an entirely different toy. Slater's thrown out. That allows Dylan to get the stomps in. Slater goes on this big comeback, punches in the corner, just hucks the referee aside. That guy's laid out for a while. Dylan comes in and continues the beating, but Slater comes back. He's got Bass beat. The referee comes back in, though, and disqualifies him. Some more heat. Slater stands tall despite losing the match. I give it two stars out of five. Again, this is a match that like is, is done technically fine. Like There was nothing really sloppy or bad about it. Just a little boring, a little slow. And of course, it's a match that comes right after a match with a very similar finish of the babyface ultimately screwing himself over because like, he gets too handsy with the referee. And uh, this is a, so around the point in the show where I'm starting to go, huh, okay, I, I'm starting to see a pattern here and I'm not liking what I see. We hear the national anthem played on the trumpet with a big spotlight on the flag. And then we get a laser light show about America all of a sudden. But now it's time for a big patriotic grudge match as Keith Larson and Ole Anderson take on the dastardly Russians. Ivan and Nikita Koloff. So let's back up a bit. Don Kernodal, who by the way is a fantastic name, not just for a wrestler, but just in general. Don Kernodal, great name.
name. Anyway, he was a heel a while ago. He joined up with the Russians. It was kind of their ally for a bit, but it led to his downfall. Several weeks ago, the Russians assaulted Kronodal and beat him so badly he was put in traction. The scene saw his family, which all happened to be in town there, like at his side as he was being tended to by the EMTs and whatnot. We see his recovery at his home with his family by his side. His younger brother, Keith Larson, wrestling for his brother's honor here alongside Ole Anderson, who is paying a debt that he owes to Don. You got Kronodal at ringside, bringing them to the ring with his neck brace and his crutch, hashtag neck strong. And by the way, this is Kronodal country, apparently, because uh, you know, Don and his brother, Keith, get some of the biggest pops of the night. But you know, watching the programming leading into this show and like seeing some of the build with like Kronodal and his family and his recovery and everything is some of the most unintentionally funny stuff at some points, especially when like the Kronodal's dad gets involved. I'm Don's father and my son is hurt really bad, but the Kronodal family is a close knit family and we will stand by him, whatever he decides to do. Keith and Oli work in Ivan Koloff's arm extensively, just beating ass for several minutes. Finally, Ivan catches a break and tags Nikita, who's all over Oli. A big bear hug that goes for a very long time. They're like, look at the muscles. And I'm like, that's not the part of the back I'm staring at. Anderson keeps slipping away, but the Russians are able to make the tags. And we go back to the bear hug. He finally fights out and gets the tag to Larson. Full head of steam, but he misses a drop kick that allows the Koloffs to regain control. All four men are brawling now. Gosh, I wonder if the finish is coming. Sure enough, Nikita waylays the injured Kronodal at ringside. Ivan decks Keith with the Russian chain amidst all the chaos, and the Russians get the win. But after the bell, in comes Don, who whomps both Russians with his crutch until it breaks into pieces. The crowd going nuts for him, getting a measure of revenge against those baddies from the Kremlin. And of course, the announcers have no clue what the final call actually was. Has Tom Miller made an official announcement on this yet? I did not hear that. Three stars out of five for me. I actually really enjoyed the story and the build leading up to this matchup here. I didn't care much about Keith Larson, who, by the way, would go on to become Rocky Kronodal in wrestling. But, I mean, the story told in the ring and everything like, leading up to it, which showed, you know, Kronodal's redemption arc, how he was like, he was so, you know, apologetic and begging for forgiveness after he was eventually betrayed by the Russians and everything. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that was probably one of the high points for him at that point. He was not going to see much bigger points in the card after he came back from his kayfabe injury. Um, but this was yeah, a good display for the Russians, uh, especially Nikita, who's still pretty relatively fresh and green at this point in his career. But you've got, uh, yeah, a nice a nice story here. Ra Ra USA to get the fans uh, happy at this point, even though it was still uh, the bad guys won again. Up next, a match of the NWA TV Championship with $20,000 on the line. By the way, we need more money stick stipulations in wrestling. Like, how come we don't have more of those? As Tully Blanchard defends against Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. These two have been feuding for months at this point, and most recently, J.J. Dillon and the Long Riders invaded Steamboat's gym and wreaked havoc. They attacked Ricky's younger brother at the gym as well on the weight bench. Tully Blanchard has also attacked Steamboat, that aforementioned boot shot that we talked about. Each man has posted $10,000 to up the ante for this match. Winner take all. Not not only that, if Blanchard gets disqualified or counted out, he will lose the championship. Both guys just lay into each other to start things off. Steamboat connects with a big shot, but his ribs are already hurt to the point where he's slowing down. Tully smells blood. Steamboat with a hold, Blanchard with a creative rope break. Tully is very cocky at this point in the match as there is this feeling out process. Suddenly, Tully with the spit and the reaction by Steamboat, very motivated as he takes over, just bloodies Tully, spits back in his face for good measure. Man, there's a lot of spitting in wrestling. Steamboat with Blanchard's own slingshot suplex. Blanchard on the apron with some sort of foreign object, a swing and a miss, but he decks Ricky with it mid-suplex and Steamboat goes down hard. He's still able to stay in the match though. A big top rope splash, sunset flip attempt. Blanchard grabs the item again and hits Steamboat with it right in front of the referee and makes the cover. The three count on a KO'd Steamboat and Blanchard retains and is 10 grand richer. 
This one gets four stars out of five for me. This overtakes Jesse Barr and Mike Graham as my favorite match of the evening. Uh, these guys just do so well together, and Ricky Steamboat always looks amazing at this point in his career, and uh, Tully Blanchard is just a fantastic heel. These guys do great. I wish that that ending where he hits Steamboat, I wish that the referee was not in such a good position to see it because I thought that almost kind of took me out of it. Uh, as far as Steamboat, though, he was not long for J.C. He would soon have a dispute uh, with the booker, Dusty Rhodes. He would leave, and a few months later, we'd see him wrestle in the first WrestleMania. In your semi-main event for the U.S. Championship, Chief Wahoo McDaniel defends against Karate Master Billy Graham, who comes out to Kung Fu fighting. Oh my god, I love this. Fresh off his recent return and departure from the WWF, he's karate chopping his way to the ring as the latest challenger. Graham takes a lot of early offense from the champ, but is able to get behind Wahoo and lock in the full Nelson. Wahoo falls into the ropes. Superstar chop! Wahoo fires back with some chops of his own, mounts a big comeback, hits one more big chop, the cover, the win, okay then. I give this match a half star out of five. This match went four minutes and 18 seconds. There were five total bumps in this thing and Wahoo took all but the final bump. At least the baby face went over this time. You know what, maybe Billy Graham would have had more success if he had brought in his tag team partner, a saber tooth dagger. Backstage, Tony Schiavone introducing the judges for tonight's main event. There's Duke Kiyomoka, special referee and boxing legend, former heavyweight champ Joe Frazier, and NASCAR driver, young Kyle Petty. Oh man, smoking Joe, this interview with him is not pretty. If I see something is wrong out there with these guys, I'm a fair guy. I would call it off. Uh, I would say it can't be done. If somebody get hurt out of it, I don't want nothing to go around because I have sons in this box. This game also just like boxing, no different. We go to that match now, the Million Dollar Challenge for the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship as the Nature Boy Ric Flair defends against former two-time world champion in the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes. It was one year ago to the night Ric Flair beat Harley Race for his second World Heavyweight Championship and has been on a roll. Also, whose million dollars is this? I hope it's not Jim Crockett's. I hope he didn't take another mortgage out in the house or something. Some dude keeps looking into the press booth as they toss the match, but they're not ready to go just yet. We hear Purple Rain and Sully and Coddle trying to stretch. Nope. The music stops. More talking. Suddenly, boom! There's some sort of pyro that goes off. Then a lot more silence. Then we get Purple Rain again. Wow. What a big old production botch to happen on your live broadcast. I mean, you better believe that did not show up in the edited versions since. We get Dusty with his beautiful white and purple robe, enters the ring to a huge ovation. Then we get like two bars of Bob Seger's old time rock and roll before it stops. We then get the also Sprock Zara Thrustra, or however you say it, then another poof of smoke. Then the nature boy comes out walking out to It's Hard to Be Humble by Mac Davis. That's pretty cool. Dusty fires off with his jabs early on, gets a nice headlock, but flare on the offensive soon after. Dusty dodging a knee, gets the figure four locked in real early. Flair thrown into the corner, flies out of the ring. Smoking Joe trying to get involved in Flair and Dusty's business in the ropes and is very slow to make a count. Flair's flung out of the ring again. Now the two are fighting outside. Dusty goes face first into the ring post and you can bet he's a bleeding. Oh my God, it looks gross at the onset. Set. By the way, I don't know if it's just me, but at a first glance, seeing the blood on Dusty's face and the way you see it kind of run up his forehead, is it me or does it kind of look like Gold Dust's makeup? After about a minute, Frazier gets in between them again. He checks the cut above Rhodes' eye and calls the match due to the injury. Ric Flair's declared the winner, still champion, and one million dollars richer. And then we get a whole lot of post-show interviews to close out the show and more guys staring into the glass. You're telling me they couldn't have figured out a way to block that shit off? Well, that is certainly a finish I did not see coming. I give this one two and a half stars out of five. Like, the stuff they were doing up until that point was great and classic flair and dusty. Like, you couldn't ask for a better tandem, and that rivalry was so good, and it would continue on for years. Like, we'd see when I talked about my Starcade The Gathering uh, review, which I'll put right here. But this was not that. You know, it was a very 
very fucky finish for your biggest show of the year to end that way on such a disappointing note. Why did we keep saying that? We look at Starcades over the years. Doesn't matter what era it is. Starcade seems to be the show where there's something disappointing happening in the main event, which is kind of just like tanks everything and all the goodwill that you're trying to build with it. Uh, and this, to me, feels like no exception. And as for the two men involved in the main event, Dusty would soon win the TV championship after this. And as for Flair, he would hold on to the gold for another year, finally dropping it at the Great American Bash to the American Dream. My grade for Starcade 84 is a C. You know, the only thing I could think of after watching that show and it was all said and done, I just thought, wow, Starcade, night of crap finishes. There were a lot of those on this show tonight, and many of which just all happened one after the other, and that really kind of uh, dampened my enjoyment of the show. I mean, there were a couple of matches that I thought were like good, really good stuff, like Steamboat and Blanchard, and then Jesse Bard by Graham. The tuxedo match was a lot of goofy ass fun. The tag match uh, had a lot of great moments as well. Uh, but you know, then a lot of the rest of the undercard was just kind of like there for me. It was just kind of eh. And then you've got that main event with all that hype around it for it to end on just such kind of like a Nah, it's such an anticlimactic, doesn't really prove anything on either side. Uh, and obviously, again, the thrill is in the chase, and we'll see Dusty eventually get that moment. He will finish his story against Flair, and even then it's not going to be done. But it's going to be this whole thing. But it's, uh, you know, it just, it's, uh, it was a disappointing way to end the show, especially for the biggest show of the year. For it to end that way... I, I bet people back then didn't like it either. Now, over the years doing these classic reviews, I haven't done too many In Your House shows. Well, that is going to change next time here when I look at In Your House 5 Seasons Beatings. You're going to have Hunter Hearst Helmsley in a hog pen match, got The Undertaker versus King Mabel in a casket match, and the main event, Shawn Michaels defending the championship against the British Bulldog. But until then, what did you think of Starcade 84 and this review? Let me know in the comment section below. Give the video a thumbs up up if you like it. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Hit that bell icon for all the notifications. I'm Brian Zane and I'll see you next time.